read about a woman who went on a trip as a tourist with one of those groups, and they went to Iceland. And while they were there in the southern highlands, they stopped at a place, and uh, she went in and changed her clothes, got a jacket on and everything. And when she got back on the bus, the tour guide bus director notified the bus that there was a missing passenger. And so they began to search for the passenger. They took hours and hours looking through the canyon, looking, they brought in the Coast Guard. And about 3 a.m., they found her, the woman that they were searching for, out searching for herself. (laughs) She had not understood that she was the one missing. Um, I think in the heart of this message today, it's the reality that we're all... um, searching for who we are. In our text in Mark chapter 10, Jesus loved this man that is termed by the gospel writer, the rich young man, the rich young ruler. Um, He loved him enough to see that he had a real problem and that that problem was that he was building his identity on the wrong things. He had taken good things and made them idols And how do we stop ourselves from the same mistakes? The solution is that we put our old identity to death. And we find in Jesus a new identity in which those old identities no longer have hold on us or are relevant. This is what Rick Warren said in his book, Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life. He said, it is only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. And so when we know who he is, Jesus, then we're able to know who we are. But not just know who we are, but know whose we are. And when we know whose we are, we know what to do. In this text in Mark chapter 10, Jesus has this man come up to him and he confronts him, he loves him, and he grieves him. I want you to notice it with me in the text. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, and as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do so that I might inherit eternal life? Now, we look at those terms in the text. He ran, he knelt, he asked. But notice the words, he said, good teacher. What should I do to deserve eternal life? What do I do to inherit eternal life? He calls him a good teacher because he admired Jesus as a rabbi, but he had not surrendered to him as Lord. He didn't mind him being a teacher, but he didn't want to call him his authority. He trusted in his own judgment. He trusted in his own works. He trusted in his own morality. He was a good man. Many people, you'll ask him, you know, why should you go to heaven? It's, well, I'm a good person. My good outweighs my bad. But we know that being good is not enough. And Jesus is going to address this in the text. He was trusting in his own merit, in his own worth. But Jesus, in verse 18, says... To him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So Jesus gets to the point as he's listening to this man and he addresses him. He says, first, let's just establish who I am. That's going to be very important. Not just what do you do, but you need to figure out who I am. And he establishes this. God. Jesus is not a self-help guru or a sage of philosophy. He's not just a moral counselor or a theological professor. He's God. God in flesh on earth before this very man. This man was talking to the supreme authority of eternal things. He says, you know that the commandments do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And the young man piped in, teacher, I've done all these things since I 
was a youth. Since my bar mitzvah, I have been right before the Lord, right? I've been what I'm supposed to be. I don't do wrong towards people. And this is a pretty good moment. He had as a checklist of his moral excellence. He's honest. He's excellent. He's earnest. He probably never was sent to the principal's office at school. He probably had an attendance record. He was a very sharp young man. And so he had a sense of self. And Jesus is going to poke on the sore spot. This is the kind of teacher Jesus is. If I was training you in evangelism, I might be more, I might be smarter than Jesus. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be. But you understand my point. I might say, now listen, Jesus, when you go and talk to the woman at the well, don't bring up the fact that she's been divorced five times. That's a bad lead-in. <laughs> right? Don't poke the sore spot. Don't bring up the, the negative. But Jesus is not fooling around, is he? Jesus gets straight to the heart because he can see right through this man. This man has some little G gods. This man has some idols in his life. He has some things that he boasts about as his identity. They matter to him. And Jesus says, if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, then your kingdom's got to go for God's kingdom to come. You've got to surrender your life. You've got to give yourself and all that you have. You've got, you know, I saw the other day this is monkey trap. Have you seen this before? That's how they catch a monkey out in the, wheel, in the jungle. They'll put a, uh, some sort of treat in a hole, and the monkey will reach his hand in there and grab a hold of it and can't get his hand out because he would not dare let go. Have you seen that before? Fascinating. That's how they catch a monkey. And this is what he's saying here in this text. He's saying, you've got to hold a firm grip on your morality, a firm grip on your influence, on your prominence, on your career, on your wealth, on all your stuff and on your accomplishments. And if you want the kingdom of God, you got to let that stuff go. you got to flip the world upside down. And you need a new estimate of what really matters in life. And you need a new rubric to appraise what is really treasure. Because what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Right? And he's poking on the sore spot. <coughs> You know the commandments. You've done good. But looking at him, verse 21, that is so wonderful. Jesus doesn't look at him with his contempt and despise him. Jesus doesn't look at him with a sense of exhaustion, right? We get exhausted, right, with people. We get, we get perturbed. We get bothered. But what is it, Jesus, when this man comes to him, Jesus, the Bible says, he loved him. He loved him. He says, one thing you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Five little imperatives there. Let loose. Give it up. Put your treasure in things that are not, as Colossians said, where rust and moth is corrupt, right? And come, follow me. I like what David Jeremiah says in this text. Jesus asked this man, are you willing to give up your home, your servants, your properties, all your wealth, and are you willing to come to a place where none of that matters as long as you get me? Am I enough? If everything else was stripped away, am I enough for you? That's what he asked him. And are you willing to surrender with reckless abandon 
and turn your affection on the Lord, not on the here and now. Go and sell it. Get rid of it. This grieved the man, the Bible says. It grieved him. Imagine it's all gone. Is Christ enough? We have to have a better view in the Bible in our day and age of what is loving. Because we have, in American culture especially, we have come to believe that just agreeing with everybody is loving. Right? We dare not offend anybody. But Jesus, that's not his way of love. Jesus loves this man enough to say that the track that you're on, the course that you're on, is not going to get you where you really want to go. Jesus loves this man enough to make him grieved. Now there's a way for us to grieve the Holy Spirit, but is there a way for the Holy Spirit to grieve us? Are we, are we allowing ourselves to be grieved, to be confronted now, not just stirred, but stirred to the point of action. He's grieved. He loves him this much. Mothers, I love this proverb, Proverbs 29, verse 15. A child left to himself is a shame to his mother. I always wonder, why didn't they say anything about the dads? A child left to themselves. Jesus is not leaving this man to himself in his thoughts. He's not leaving him alone. That's love, isn't it? It's not loving to say, well, I'm just done with you. I'm, I've had it up to here. I'm writing you off. I'm not even going to waste my words on you. That's not loving. What's loving is to roll up your sleeves and say, all right, let's go for it. <laughs> you lacking something. And I'm going to talk to you about it. He was deeply dismayed by these words. And he went away grieving. And he was one who owned much property. Hmm. I used to watch Fred Sanford, Sanford's son. That dates me good, doesn't it? Grady came in, said, Fred, I need $20. Fred said, you got me at a bad time. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this man had it had lots of stuff and it grieved him Jesus is not talking about those who have wealth but he's talking about those who wealth has them it's hard to enter into heaven when you don't see your need it's hard to please God when you're not willing to do anything but please yourself. It's hard when you're building your own name. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil some people eager for money wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs this money has got a hold of him this identity has got a hold of him he will not let loose of it and the disciples as they were listening to Jesus in verse 24 they're amazed by these words, but Jesus responded again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the little eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. That is, it's impossible to strut into the kingdom of God in your own power. It's impossible to by your own accomplishments make it into the kingdom of God. You must see yourself as needy and bankrupt before the Lord. And they, in verse 26, were even more astonished when he said this. And they said to him, then who can be saved? 
Looking at Jesus, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know, our church is two years old, getting into our third year here, and when my granddaughter was born, it was about the same time we were planting the church in the first year. And so when Flora was one, our church is one. When Flora is two, our church is two. And, you know, just watching that, it makes me think about our church like that. Like, a, like, like what, we're just a baby church, right? We're just a toddler church. Like I went to uh, a wedding Sunday, last Sunday, and when I walked in the door, Carly, my daughter-in-law, just held Flora up and said, thank you. And she was just like, oh, my gosh. Flora was in her little flower dress for the flower girl. And, I mean, she was a turd. Okay? She was terrible. She made a mess. I and mean, she didn't even go down the aisle like she's picking up. She's, she's literally hijacked with her personality all the attention of the whole wedding. And then when they danced at the end, the, the bride and the groom, she just ran out on the thing and ran around them. And I'm like, can you not give them even a moment of their attention? <laughs> I think about our church growing and stumbling and struggling and maturing. And that's my prayer, that God would help us to mature. That God would help us to be a strong church, a loving church. I'm so proud of you, by the way. This last week when the Harringtons got the news and Emma and all the struggle, this church just, just swarmed in with love, loving the Harringtons. Thank you so much for that. And when Mandy and Brian, when her daddy died, you just swarmed in and loved them so well. And that just makes me so proud to see a church like this. <clears throat> but we're growing, our church is. And um, we're becoming what God wants us to be collectively, but hopefully individually. God is growing you in your faith. The Bible says that God gives pastors to the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And that word equip in the Greek, it means to uh, prepare a soldier for battle. And so sometimes when I'm teaching, I'm teaching to toughen you up and get you ready for the war that's coming. Sometimes it, that Greek word is used, equip, it means to pack a ship for a long journey. And I think part of the work is to get you what you need so that the course that you're on in life, whether you're here or the Lord launches you out of here to go somewhere else, my prayer is that every time you come here, and you get biblical teaching that it's equipping you to do the things and go and be in, a, in the journey that God's called you to be on. But also it's used, that word equip is used to like if you have a broken arm and you set the bone and wrap it so that it can heal back and be restored. And so some teaching is restorative. That is, it helps you be healthy and function in the way that God intended you in the very beginning to function. And I think that's the way I feel about this text and about just setting our lives in the proper way, the proper mindset. I'm so thankful as I study these things about my first pastor. Because I grew up a, really a first-generation Christian. I my, my family weren't Christians. And so a church like this came and got me when I was around 10 and then loved me through some really rough times until I was about 15. And then when I was at 15, uh, one of the youth guys shared the gospel that night. And I received the Lord. And then I remember sometime between 15 and 19, our pastor preaching a series on money. And it was like a Sunday night series and it was... Manage your money or your money will manage you, something like that. You know, it was, a, it was like a long one. He was prone. He would get into Genesis and preach for two years in Genesis, right? So he didn't care. He almost liked to ag agitate the crowd with his teaching, but uh, <laughs> cantankerous. 
But I remember getting teaching that probably all of you just know as like common sense. <laughs> like normal people know this stuff. Why didn't you know this, Chad? I just didn't know it. And so I would come to church and be equipped with this teaching that was so overt and plain and helpful and practical that I'm sure there were some people in the church that were like, oh, brother. And they were bothered by the teaching, but not me. I just remember thinking, I'm so glad somebody's teaching this to help set us on track, to get our minds right about money. The Bible, 200, 500 scriptures on prayer, 2,000 scriptures on money. <clears throat> And so this morning I want to teach three principles about giving and, and about this idea of um, releasing. The first is the principle of first fruits. Jesus would say this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things will be added to you. This is what is boiled down to the idea of faith. If you're going to be a Jesus follower and a Bible believer and you're going to be obedient to the callings and the principles and the workings of God through Scripture, then you have to come to a place where you trust the Lord. Even when you don't see it. Even when you don't fully understand it, but you just treat the Word of God as authoritative. Somebody said one time, he said, I can't be a self-made man. I've never made a man. I don't have any history in making a man. But God's made a lot of men. He has authority and experience track record on making men and women mature. And so we're going to follow his lead. And the first thing is to give God the first fruits. And we get this all the way through the Bible, but just one example is Cain and Abel. Abel would say everything he belong, has belongs to the Lord. So he'd bring the first of the flock. He'd bring the first thing to the Lord. And it was a way of, of faith and worship. But Cain's mind, mindset was this all is my work. This is what I've accomplished. And he would make sure his bills were paid. He'd make sure everything he had was secure. He'd make sure everything was... And then he'd bring scraps to God. And it's the difference. It's the difference in the mindset. Are you going to give God the first? Giving God what is first is living by faith. Giving God what is last is living in your own strength. Does God get the first? The first of your day in prayer. The first of your priorities. The first of your heart. The first of your resources. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 3 says. And I love this verse so much. I'll start in verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For the length of days and the long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on a tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. You know, whenever I first got my first job, like I said, we weren't in a Christian home. And so my mom only had one bit of financial advice when I got my first paycheck. She, this was her warning. Don't go down there to the church and give them any of that money. She meant well. According to her value system, she was giving me wisdom. But I learned over time that that was terrible advice. Now that made total sense if you have a worldly mindset. 
But if you have a kingdom mindset and a godly mindset, then you want to take the first fruits. That is, if you have $10, which dollar belongs to the Lord? The first one. The first fruit you give to the Lord. I didn't know this, but the Hebrews would say that an evening and a day, a morning or a day. See, we work backwards. We think we get up in the morning, that's the first of the day, and then we end the day tired and we rest. But in the Hebrew word, the evening, we started with rest. And same thing, we still do it today. The Sunday is the last day of the week for us, for most part, isn't it? We run through all the week, and then Sunday we're, we finish the week. But the Bible says that the Sunday is the first day of the week, and we give it to the Lord. We start the week with our mind on the Lord. We start the day resting in the Lord. And we start with what the Lord gives us and returning it back to Him. It's the principle of the first fruits. All the way through the Bible. It takes faith to give the first seeds and believe that God's going to give the increase. But don't lean on your own understanding. I was listening to Kyle over at Summit, and he said that in a message, he said that when he, because he also was born in a home that wasn't Christian, and he said that when he first got his first paycheck, that he had a Dell computer, that he had a $30 a week or a month payment. And he said he looked at his tithe and the payment, and he said, I didn't know how I was going to do both. But he went to church and he made his commitment to the Lord first. And he made the gift. And then that day at church, somebody walked up and gave him an envelope. And it's a true story. He said that, now by the way, he said it never happened again. So this was kind of a first moment in his walk with the Lord, how God wanted to affirm something in his life. He said that a man in his church the night before had been praying and the Lord put it on that man's heart to write an amount. And he, he put on the check Dale Computers. And he goes and gives it to, to Kyle. And Kyle gets there that day, makes his gift to the Lord, and then this man gives it to him. And he gets the check, and it's not for the $30. It's for an amount that he doesn't know. But when he goes back home and he looks at his paperwork, it's for the total amount that he owed on the computer. I have, a, I have a similar story for me. When I first got into ministry, I was struggling, and I needed a, a printer. I was sitting, in fact, the Lord had given me this new ministry in college ministry at ASU, and, um, I mean, we were broke. We didn't have anything. And uh, I was over there. I was sitting in a folding chair, and I was like, I was complaining. I was like, Lord, here I am following you, and I ain't got jack. <laughs> I'm tired of this, right? I was complaining to the Lord. I'm like, I need a printer. Walmart's got a printer for $178. I need a printer. And I need some office equipment. And I started making my demands to the Lord. But you know, he was so gracious to me. I got a check in the mail for the amount of that printer the next day. It was like God's winking at me. And then there was a fellow over there named Bill Mantooth who walked to my office. He said, Chad, you need an office. I said, I know. And he wrote me a check for $5,000 hand to me. He said, go buy you some office equipment. And when he left, I just sat there in my stupid little folding chair, shaking my head and saying, Lord, I hear you. I hear you. I know what you're trying to say to me. Seek the Lord first in his kingdom and all these other things will be added to you. Now here's the thing. I'm saying this as honest as I can say it to you. I'm not preaching to you today about giving because I want money. I want something from you. I'm preaching to you about surrender and giving because I want something for you. I want the, the ending of the worry and the ending of the anxiety and the ending of the 
holding it all on your shoulders to try to make it all work. I want that to come to an end, and I want you to come to a place of freedom and of grace and of peace and of surrender and of favor from God. David said it this way, I'm young, I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. And so the first fruits, I pray this for our church, that our church would become a first fruits church. That we would give him the first of the day, the first of the week, the first of our resources, the first, that he would become pre- preeminent in our lives. That we would bless the Lord with whatever he puts in our hands. I'd say it this way, if you have a chainsaw, use it for the Lord. Right? If you have a jet ski, especially use it for the Lord. (laughs) The second principle, the principle of appropriation. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. That is, in proportion to your income. Save it up and give it. And let the Lord use it. I was teaching, we planted several churches in East Kenya in a place called Malindi uh, over about a decade period. And they invited me to come. And they, the missionary, James, said, Hey, would you come and teach for two days straight, two eight hour days, 16 hours of teaching to these young preachers, these church leaders? And they asked me to come. So I came and I was teaching. And one day, there was a young man named William right here. He was from a little village called Sanguaya. And William couldn't contain his, his, um, his silence. He spoke up. He said, well, that's easy for you because you're a rich American. It's easy for you to give. And I said, William, if you don't get this principle, you will hinder the work of God in your life, in your family, and in these churches. William, if you can't give a dollar when you got $10, you won't be able to give $30 when you got $300. You won't be able to give $3,000 when you got $30,000. You won't be able. You might as well start when you don't have much. If you figure this out when you don't have much. See, this is the thing. William, he would argue, I don't have enough to be faithful to the Lord and give. The rich man would say, I have too much to be faithful and give to the Lord. And that honest truth is, whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, it's always going to have faith required. It's always going to require some obedience. It's always going to be a challenge for you. It's always going to mean that you're going to trust the Lord with your finances and with your life and with your substance and your wealth. It's always going to mean that. There's a verse that's very curious to me in Matthew 13, verse 8. It says, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away. That's a weird verse to me. Because I can get, okay, those of you that have, you're going to get more. But those of you that don't have, you'll have what you have taken away. I thought you just said, Jesus, they don't have anything. How can you be taking away stuff that they don't even have? That's a curious Bible verse. He's talking about giving. I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying those that discount what God has given them, those who say, well, I don't have much, so I'm not going to give it and use it for the Lord. Even that that they have will be taken away. God gave you, even if he gave you a little bit of talent, He gave you that talent to use for him. You see what's going on there? The man in Matthew that doesn't have much thinks, what's the point? But the point is faithfulness to the Lord. Learn now. I told William there in that missions teaching, I said, if you, don't, if you guys don't get this now, because we taught the indigenous principle, that is, whatever happened there had to be happened through the indigenous people. They weren't going to have anybody come and fund anything or work anything because we learned that if they're always wanting someone else to take care of, then we're robbing them from the biblical principles and they're going to just, we're going to completely stunt the growth of the movement of God. 
We know this because in China, in China early on, in the, uh, years and years ago, there were missionaries sent from Britain that came and all the money came from Britain and all that was there and it was just kind of an anemic work of God and then communism came in and took all the missionaries out and when all the missionaries were out and all the money was out and all they had what was left was the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and God Himself, and then the church in China multiplied with extensive exponential growth. The indigenous principle. They began to bear the weight of the responsibility that whatever God had put in their hand, they're supposed to use it. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to test, says the Lord, and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing to meet your need. And then the last thing that I would just say is, don't touch that which is holy. The Bible says in Leviticus, Leviticus that these gifts, the, the tithe is holy unto the Lord. And when we surrender our life, it's an act of giving to Jesus full authority over our lives. And we can struggle with this. Well, Jesus is the one. There's uh, two rich people in this text there's two rich young rulers. There's the rich young ruler that had too much property to give up and serve the Lord. But then there's another rich young ruler. And this is what Corinthians chapter 8 says. It says it this way. It says that he, Jesus, for you know the grace of our Lord in verse 9. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. That... Through his poverty, we might become rich. Yeah. There's two rich young rulers here. There's one that's grasping and holding on and has his identity in his own self and all of this. And then there's another one. And this is, I think, maybe part of the reason that Jesus looks on him and loves him. Because Jesus knows what it's like to give up, to take off to come down from the throne and humble himself, as Philippians 2 says. You know, this passage here, we learn something in this passage. This rich young man comes to Jesus, and the Bible says he goes away grieved. And I wanted to take a moment this morning as I end the message. I want you to just consider with me this, this question. There's not another time, is there, that this man comes back to Jesus. This is it. This is his one encounter. We have no record in the New Testament, in the book of Acts or any of the epistles. We have no record of this man ever coming back to Jesus. It's a scary business. The Bible says he was grieved because he had much property he wasn't able to let loose and surrender every other thing that we make our identity about gets in the way under the lordship of Jesus Christ if we're not able to trust the Lord and make him Lord of all as one man said, that he didn't want to be Lord at all. Right? He, he wants our whole life. What could have been like different if the man that came to Jesus, he comes running up, he kneels down, he asks Jesus, good teacher, what does I have to do to inherit eternal life? What, what could it, how could the story have ended differently? I, I just wrote down this. I thought, well, one thing he could have done is he could have said, I know you're not just a good teacher. I know you're the Lord. And so if you want to inherit eternal life, if you want to know what it's like to be born again, if you want this same salvation that this man is seeking, the first thing you do is not just 
say, man, the teachings of Jesus are curious. The teachings of Jesus are interesting. The teachings of Jesus, of Jesus fascinate me. No, Jesus is Lord of my life. And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. That's the second thing. He's the only God I have. He's the only one that gets that kind of preeminence in my life. He gets the priority. He gets the first in my life. And then the last thing. I'm not grieved by your word. I receive your word. 